Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar sponsored and presented by MAPAY, entitled Work Smarter, Faster, and More Efficiently. My name is Sharon Schaller. I'm the Member Engagement Manager here at NWFA, and I'll serve again, once again, as your moderator for today's webinar. And uh, so now I'd like to introduce our presenter for today's webinar, and this is Sam Biondo. Sam is MAPAY's National Technical Presenter, he has more than 25 years of international installation experience in the flooring industry. As the host of MAPE's popular MTI TV series of videos, and as a speaker at many industry functions, including NWFA, Sam combines installation experience with real world knowledge to help audiences easily comprehend new innovative technologies and their applications. So without further delay, let's get started with this webinar. Take it away, Sam. All right, thank you so much. First off, for everybody attending, thanks, man. Really appreciate it. So work smarter, work faster, work more efficiently. Gosh, that is so easy to say. I can just tell you to drink an extra cup of coffee and you can work faster. Um, or go ahead and you know be more efficient. That was one of the key things when I started. Um, but the other, part of this that I the rabbit hole that I went down was I started looking into okay this generation is in the business does phenomenal work and 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 everything is fine but how do we hand this off to the next generation and why don't they want it and after researching this for about three weeks I could probably do an eight hour presentation on this subject matter I found it so intriguing to find out so many different things and so many facts and so many different areas that haven't been researched and that people just take for granted. So we're gonna talk about that today too. Um, remember, as always, as a manufacturer, there are new products being made all the time. And it's not always because we don't have anything to do. It's because there are new regulations that are constantly being put out there and it, it forces us to change and upgrade and make better products for you not for us. Believe me, we, we make all the products we want to make for us. It's all for making products for you, the installer, and the people that are out there that are using the end user of the products. We're going to talk about work-life balance because this is really important. And again, this is one of those things that I kind of got into that I was a little uh, shocked about. Understanding the new products and how they can help, training to extend the longevity and the of the current installers, and how to recruit and talk to new ones or potential new ones. And this was an interesting thing too. Um, in our side of the business, we're a little behind the eight ball. You'll see what I mean in a minute. So let's talk about work-life balance, man. You know what, you, it's an easy thing to talk about. Um, it's an interesting, if you think about it, it is extremely interesting. I recently did a, um, a webinar for uh, high school, the state of Florida High School Students Association. There was about 900 students on the webinar. I had 15 minutes. The person in front of me tagged dolphins and tracked them for a living. The person in front of that person um, trained bankers to be high-end bankers. I'm like, what am I going to talk about? I talked about giving presentations is what I talked about and how not everybody's comfortable doing it. And that doesn't mean that the people that aren't don't know what they're talking about. Cause that's not it. Everyone has a talent. This, you know, talking and giving a presentation has, is a talent in itself. And the very first question, when I opened it up to questions that somebody asked me, cause I explained about me going and doing presentations on the road and going and doing, um, uh, webinars and seminars and, and conventions and trade shows. Very first question asked me was by a 16 year old young lady who asked me, how did I manage my work life balance? And I was taken aback by the question. That was not what I expected to hear. And I was like, well, what do you mean? She says like, well, if you're traveling that much, how do you pay enough proper attention to your family? Ow, <laughs> like that hurt a little bit. But the more I thought about it, I did eventually come to a work-life balance. And one of the ways that I, and this is just personally, I'm sharing this with you, one of the ways that I do it now, I have a giant 
calendar of the whole year of every place I'm going to travel and I look for gaps in between those travels and I make sure I take time and during those gaps to be with my family, to see my two sons and to make sure I'm paying enough attention to my family, my dad, my, my wife, my kids, my brothers and sisters, my friends. And that definitely helped. Once I, once I learned how to do that, it helped on the work side. So we're gonna talk a little bit about work-life balance and why it's important. How did we get here? Well, let's just start back in World War II. Um, because all the men were at war, women started entering the workforce and it changed the dynamic of what we thought was the American family. Um, the man went to work, the woman stayed at home. Well, that didn't work out like that anymore. There's less men at work and there was less women at home. There's longer work hours. Um, one of the things in my family is there are no, guys, this is the man's role and this is the woman's role. There are roles and whoever excels at that role, they take that role. So I'm gonna mow the front yard, I'm also gonna wash the dishes because that's what I like to do. Um, my wife had, does certain things. Now, if somebody breaks in my house, I'm gonna be the one that gets up and handles it. I don't want my wife handling it. I, so my point being is, in this day and age, there is no, this is man's work, woman's work, there is just work, and everyone as a, as a group and as a unit has to figure out how to get that work done with the person's best of their abilities. Also, there's an aging labor force, and that's what we're gonna talk about. Guys like me are kind of aging out. I haven't, honestly, I haven't installed professionally in 15, 20 years, um, but there are other people out there that are, that are, that workforce, that number is coming up and we're not replacing them fast enough with a younger workforce. This is a problem, but there are some solutions we're gonna get there. So we'll talk about millennials first. The millennial generation is the largest percentage of the construction workforce in the US. Um, the majority of the research though has been geared towards professional occupations. So when we look at, well, what do millennials want? When, they, when you see that research, it's never, what does a millennial construction worker want? What does a millennial floor man want? What does a, a millennial electrician want? That's not where that, where that um, research has been geared towards. It's, a, it's what does a millennial advertising person want? It's those professional occupations. It's a little different today than it has been. The other thing is the difference, one of the big differences between millennials and the generation that follows after them which is Gen Xers, is that millennials tend to spend a little more time and a little more money on college educations. Gen Xers, not so much. There's an advantage there that we're gonna go through. And definitely it, a lot of this research has been ignoring the needs of the younger generation, who whether we like it or not, whether we agree with what they think and how they think or not, they are going to replace us. It's, it's, not, it's not like it's something we can fight. This is exactly what's going to happen. So we better figure out how to work with them to hand the knowledge off that we have and put it in their hands and then get out of their way and let them do with what they're gonna do with that knowledge. I think our generation, I'll speak personally, my generation personally, Anytime, you know, you can, by overworking your basics, you can be escaping personal problems by throwing all of your available time and energy into work. Associating work constantly with a certain status in life. Focusing on earning more money by working more. These were all trends and traits I actually absolutely suffered from at some point in time in my career. Um, it's... It, by going to work and trying to just ignore the problems that you might be having, um, that's not going to solve those problems. Um, associating working constantly for a certain status in life. I had a great conversation with my dad who the older he gets, believe it or not, actually gets smarter. And we were talking about people that were successful. And my dad asked me what I thought the definition of success was. And I came up with some, well, you're gonna have a really nice house and a really nice car. And he said, what if you're, what if you wanted to be the best garbage man ever? And you were, were well, you successful? And the answer to that question after thinking about it is yes, you are. And I had to like dial everything back. I had to reopen up my mind, kind of get off of old 
standards that I had in my mind and really start thinking about this, tra this path that we were heading down here. Focusing on earning more money by working more. I can tell you that's the way we were trained. You want to make more money, you need to work more. But I can tell you the next generation doesn't think like that. If you opt to work instead of spend time with your friends and family, eventually those relationships are going to dissipate. They're going to they're they're going to sour and they're going to go away. Um, I I I have friends I haven't seen or talked to in years because we all just kind of dug in our heels and went to work. And now that we're getting older, we are trying to reach back out and connect with each other. But we missed that time that we shouldn't have missed. If I had to lean down and whisper into young Sam's ear. I would have a different story for him. I would tell him, work is fine, but focus on your family. Make sure you keep, make sure you understand who your friends are and make sure you work on that relationship with your family and your friends. Um, it's good for your soul. It's good for your spirit. Um, you can also suffer from job burnout. And I've seen that happen where people have a fantastic job and they put all of their energy and time into it. And eventually mm, it just, it doesn't work out for them. They're no longer passionate about what they do and the quality of their work will definitely suffer. Um, if you no longer like what you do, if you no longer like swinging a mallet and nailing a floor, it's, it's going to show. <laughs> so you better love what you do. And, and if you don't love what you do, then it's time to reinvent yourself. If you're a boss, you need to make sure you determine what is the most important thing in running your business each day. Focus on those tasks first. Don't get caught up in the weeds. Don't get caught up in the minutia. Stay current with technology. This right here is going to be a theme. You want to take breaks and vacations. You want to make sure you delegate work. If you don't have people around you that you can delegate work to, you hired the wrong people. You need to go get the right people. You need to start delegating this mundane work and the lesser work so you can focus on the tasks that really make your business run. If you're an employee, make sure you spend time with your family. You're seeing a trend here. Put the phone down. Put it down. Put it down. My kids come over for dinner once a week. We have a game. Everybody puts their phone in the middle of the table. Nobody's the first person that touches their phone has to wash dishes. If that nobody touches their phone, then I get to wash them. Do something you like in your negotiations when you're getting a job or a job you already have. Negotiate for maybe a little more time off or a different time off arrangement where you'll work for tens maybe in the summertime. Right now, employers are more open to, to these types of ideas than they've ever been. They had to because they can't find enough people to do the work. Seek companies that understand the need for a work-life balance and go to work for them. As an employee, research that stuff. Find out what the company's about, what their policies are about, and then go to work for them. If you're energized at work, it's going to show. If your, work is if, you, if your work is depriving of your energy, it's going to show. The job does not define you. You define the job. And I say this all the time. Be proud of the work you do. If you're an installer, are you signing the back of your floors? So the next person who tears that floor up 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 years from now, they're going to see your name. If you're not, why aren't you proud of the work you're doing? Put your name on the floor. You're, you, my friend, are a construction artist. You're not a construction worker. You're a construction artist. You take ugly floors and you make them look pretty. Write your name to it. Be the Picasso of your, of your business. Put your name on the bottom of that floor. One of my fondest memories of doing a job was the Casa Marina Hotel in Key West, Florida. Not only was the location fantastic, but it was a historical restoration. And we had to pull up this antique pine, river pine floor. And it wasn't the pine floor that failed, it was the subfloor underneath that started deteriorating and was falling through. So we tore up the floor 
And when we tore up the floor, I found a rolled up newspaper from the New York Times from 1920. And on the front page of that newspaper, a whole bunch of people signed their name in pencil on the front of that. And I assumed those were the workers on that job. And they threw that under the floor in a little time capsule for me to find. And I just thought that was so cool that they were so proud of their work and they wanted me to find that. Write your name on the floor, write your name on the job, put it in a place or in a way that someone that the next guy can find it. So let's talk about what's gone on during this COVID pandemic. How has the pandemic changed the construction industry? Well, from February of 2020 to April of 2020, we lost almost a million jobs, over a million jobs in the construction industry. That ain't good. Then everybody realized that construction was essential. This is back when you either had an, an essential or a non-essential title. Um, and everything took back off from that point on. The problem is, is that every time you have a dip or a drop, people that were thinking about maybe getting out of the business but are still in there, they don't come back. And so now things of, uh, as you can see in this graph right here, from April of 2020 to February of 2021, you can see how things have risen up and kind of plateaued off. And most of that was in residential. Now, why do you think that happened? I can tell you why it happened at my house, because there I was sitting on my back porch, waiting for the next Zoom meeting, looking around and going, I need to remodel this backyard. These lights are terrible. How come I've never changed these lights? I repainted my fence. I took, put all new electrical in my yard. I had my pool redone, my patio redone. I painted my back porch. I got more done in those two months that I was sitting at home than I've gotten done in 10 years of weekends because I had time to sit there and think about it. And that's what other people are doing while they're sitting at home and while they're working at home, they're looking around their house and going, we're gonna, if we gotta sit in this place, I wanna remodel it. And there's been a ton of remodeling work going on. And one of the things that gets remodeled during remodeling work is floors. But what has changed in the construction industry? Well, I'm gonna tell you right now, construction technology is changing and it's changing right in front of our eyes as we, as we know it. The use of construction drones, thermal cameras, wearables, all can be used to monitor workers. And on bigger jobs, Europe again, once again, guys, Europe is in front of us on this. Um, Europe uses a ton of these, a ton of drones on some of these larger jobs. Thermal cameras, wearables, meaning that they can track where you're at, they can track your location in a building. Project management software has changed. And then the best part about this whole thing, which I found totally fascinating, was construction robots, autonomous and semi-autonomous construction equipment. You should see some of these construction robots that are out there in the world, and there's companies making these. And the dates that when I saw these things were like 2016, 2017. I got very excited. It's 2021. We should start seeing these more and more on jobs. And in countries like Taiwan, in Southeast Asia, in, in, um, in Europe, you're seeing a lot more of these types of construction robots, autonomous and semi-autonomous um, equipment being used on job sites. It's not because they want to replace construction workers because the industry doesn't, it doesn't have a choice. The work, the jobs that are filled by humans are not being filled. And so this is being, re you're being replaced by these autonomous and, and semi-autonomous equipment. One of the biggest trends in, in, in going on right now is off-site modular construction, where they pre-build and pre-make a lot of the rooms and a lot of the sections of a house or a building and then ship them out to the job site and just connect them together like a modular home. Only some of these homes are have poured concrete slabs on them already. They have the electrical, the plumbing, everything in there, and we're just bolting this thing together. Now, why is there that an advantage? Well, the first thing is it's built in an assembly line fashion, okay? Next thing is the quality control. You can go and look and recheck 
It's not like the, you're waiting for the inspector to come out. The inspector t walks through the building once, and then you close the wall up, and you, and you no longer see the stuff. And if you had to build 100 of those units right there, you would get better and better as you progressed and built every one. There's also around-the-clock shifts. The work environment is cleaner and safer, and it streamlines the assembly to where these units are shipped out, and these are put together in condos or buildings or houses or office com complexes, shopping malls. It's really interesting, and it's a very big part of the business, and they do a majority of that work in-house. The AC systems are already pre-mounted. Um, it was really shocking to see how much of that and the stats on that. I, I, again, I'll tell you, the more I dug into this, the more I realized, I, I was like, I could do an eight-hour presentation on what's going on. The other thing, and this is kind of an upside from since the COVID, um, job sites were always, we always attempted to be clean and safe, but they are definitely clean and safer now than they used to be. And the one thing I always joked about is you can see the little fella here wearing the uh, the construction mask on his face. But I mean, we've been wearing those. We were actually our trade and and doctors and in medical field are probably the only two trades where we had to wear masks like that and be comfortable doing it. Um, but right now, like th this right here is from a job site sign from the Fort Lauderdale. Um, Business Association, I believe it is, and it's about working on job sites. If you feel sick, don't go to work. Wear a face mask all the time. Maintain your six foot. Practice good hygiene and clean and disinfect all shared access and equipment routinely. We should we should have been doing that all along. I don't know about the social distancing part, but um, we definitely should have been doing that all along. So job sites are a little cleaner. There's there seems to be less accidents on job sites right now because of everyone's caution and because everyone's just paying just a little bit more attention. On a positive note, the in the in the construction industry could potentially use these recent changes to absolutely diversify its workforce. The pandemic has plunged the industry into the quickest and deepest possible experiment in flexible working in the history of the business. I spoke with a gentleman the other day. He asked me not to use his name or the name of his company, so I'm gonna respect that. Um, what he told me was he has two crews, they work 12 hours a day, and he pays them for 40 hours. And so one crew works Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the other crew works Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and he can maneuver, he can double up on job sites, he can, he has a lot more flexible work schedule, it gives, the workers are happier, they have four days off in a row, Every, it, it seems to be a win-win, and, and basically when he said he crunched his numbers, he got more production out of his people, he got, he had better success out of his people, and it allowed him to have more maneuverability to either load up on a job or draw down on a job as he needed to. And so he kept his numbers. He said he actually makes more money now per job than what he was making before. Construction companies have the ability to adapt to these changes and could make the industry more accessible and attractive to a larger, younger talent pool. Now, the one of the things I've learned during this research was Gen Xers and millennials all want more control over their time. The days of you go to work at seven, you get done at 3.30, they don't wanna hear that. They watch their grandfathers and they've watched their fathers and mothers suffer from this. And this is not what they wanna do. And it's not, if, unless you know how to make them want to do this, we're gonna have to figure out a way to attract them. And so we're gonna have to be a little more flexible in the way we think about working and getting things done. And I think this side of the business, in, in the business world, I mean the construction industry, is kind of a little behind the times on this and is dragging its feet. But this, I'm beginning to lean towards, this is the only way I see in potentially attracting that next generation. Let's talk about some of that new technology out there. So one thing you noticed, okay, I work for Mapei and we're an adhesives manufacturer, and you haven't heard me talk about products one bit here, and I'm really just gonna mention one slide, and I'm just gonna mention product categories, and then the rest of this is about the technology outside of the products. And I can tell you as a manufacturer, 
we utilize a lot of this technology now in our plants for production because we have the same problem that installation companies are having that is hard to find quality workers to come in and do the job so new products are developed out there with sustainability in mind the one thing both of my sons i have two sons a 33 year old and a 28 year old now and both of my sons talk to me about sustainability. They understand it completely. They were raised with it within the school system. They have been talked about this and uh, this too since the day they were in the school system. This is why you constantly hear about the environment from them. It's constantly sustainability. It doesn't matter whether we like it, believe in it, or understand it. They do, and they are the future of our business. As millennials start to dominate the construction workforce business, sustainable products are in extremely high demand and they only want to use them. This benefits not only the health of the building, but also the installers, young and old, because one of the, one of the valuable commodities we have in the business is the older installer, someone who can go ahead and bestow his wisdom on the next generation coming up, or lack thereof in some cases. Customers and installers want safe products. I can tell you from a manufacturing standpoint, some of these are easier to use high flow levelers, um, water resistant cement patches. That's a big trend right now. Um, hybrid gypsum products, water-based finishes, health compliant adhesives that are highly moisture resistant, that don't break down under high moisture um, scenarios. So there's, there's lots and lots and lots of manufacturers that are making a whole bunch of really cool and good products to keep up with the times. It doesn't mean the old ones are bad, but it means there is a shift and change in the business and in the mentality of the products that are required out there for our installs. And I want you just to look at that picture right there. Take that in. How long do you think it would take and how many men do you think it would take for to put down that herringbone brick pattern right there that you're seeing? This machine, this robot is doing it right there in front of you. You're dumping the bricks in the top of it. It is not only putting the bricks, it's applying the sand and flattening it out before it puts the bricks down on top of it. This is the future. This is what's going to take place. This is what's going to replace that physical manual labor. It's a good thing, and it's not a good thing. Now, the upside is this. Someone's going to have to maintain the machine. Someone's going to have to fix it. Somebody's going to have to invent it. Somebody's going to have to design it. Somebody's going to have to fill it. Somebody's going to have to run it and operate it and understand it. But that's pretty awesome looking to see that right there. That's a whole lot of work being done in no time. This is another unique technology. So this is an autonomous unit. That exoskeleton that's on that guy, he is operating the crane with the scooper right there by his hands. He opens his hands up, the scooper opens up. He puts his hands together, the scooper closes. He picks his arms up, it raises up. He moves it over. He literally is digging the hole with that exoskeleton without ever touching a shovel. This is the future. This might be what can convince somebody who maybe doesn't want to go to college, but still has a, has a brain about him and wants to come to work and maybe is willing to go ahead and get into the construction business with the understanding that in the future, he might be able to run his own business. This is current right here. This is a current photograph right here of a, of a machine that's basically jackhammering a wall. How many times have you held a jackhammer in your hand and busted up a floor? I certainly could have used one of these when I was installing. Now notice what the guy's using. It has joysticks on it. Who do you think is better prepared to work a machine like this with joysticks? Me or the guy sitting on the couch? That kid who sits on the couch and plays video games and has since the day he was born. I think that guy actually is gonna be better with this machine, have a better touch with, this, with the machine. This is framing walls. This is framing a box right here. It's all autonomous. It's just that you, you put in the CAD drawing and the machine does the work. 
Now, we shouldn't act too shocked because in the wood flooring business, we've already had machines. We've had CNC machines, and mill, and, you know, engraving and milling and pre-cutting um, floors and things like that for us. So the technology is, that's, that is, that technology is, I wouldn't call it new, but 25 years ago it wasn't there. If I was going to do anything like this, it was with a, uh, it was with a saw and me doing it by hand and then trying to hand fit all those pieces together and with a chisel. Now it can all be done with a CNC machine. So who, this guy right here. I can relate to this 100%. This guy right here, why is that the machine he has? Why isn't there a machine that'll nail the floor for him? Because if I'm gonna attract this guy, I don't think this is what's gonna do it. I think if that's the job I'm offering him, why would he go in and do that? When he could get paid probably as much to sit behind a computer, which is natural to him. So you gotta remember this generation right here, they grew up with cell phones. Their whole lives, there were cell phones. There was no growth of technology. Diversity, they grew up with diversity. When in their lifetime, they grew up, the first time they were consciously thinking about it, there, there was a black president. They think that's the norm. They don't know that that was, that was something that, that was the first time it happened. They grew up diverse. They grew up electronically gifted and if you think you're going to take the electronic gifting out of their hands you don't think somebody who can who can work that that joystick and that computer right there is going to go well, wait why do i got to swing a hammer why don't we have a robot for this and that's a great question why don't we have a robot for this or why don't we have something that makes it a little bit easier and a little bit more efficient i didn't put the picture in but i saw a picture of a it looks like a roomba which is like a vacuum, only it's a three, it's a printer. And the printer goes on the floor. You download the blueprints into a chip, you put the chip into this thing, and it does the layout for you on the floor, exact and precise, and writes what goes there. It tells you bathroom in between the two lines where the studs go. It shows you where the plumbing pipe goes. It shows you where the electrical pipe goes. It was awesome, and the machine just goes and does it all by itself. It works in conjunction with. And if you can't invent a machine that nails, can somebody please invent a machine that makes this easier? Because there's absolutely nothing I dreaded more in the business than etching. But how am I going to convince him that this is a good idea? I mean, seriously, we're not making a good case for ourselves. Why don't we challenge him to come up with something that does this without him having to bend over like that? Listen, we have to rethink the way we're approaching this if we want this group of people to join us in our business. By the way, these are Gen Xers. We're gonna talk about these on the closing part of this. So the first thing that we need to do is, the people we currently have, we're gonna to need to train because the one thing these kids, this generation likes is they like to continually be trained and educated in the newest technologies. If we're gonna bring this kind of technology into a job site, then you can't expect this guy right here to understand how to use it. So we're always gonna have to train. Richard Branson said, train people well enough so they, so they can leave. Treat them good enough so they don't want to. That's one of the complaints I hear all the time is every time I send my guy and go get him trained, he, they take off and leave. That used to bother me. Now I use it as a badge of honor when an apprentice would leave and go out on his own. I can remember when I eventually left the two guys that trained me, Mike and Pete, and I went out on my own and I had my, I ran my very first job. And the second I got that job, my mind went blank and didn't know how to do anything. And I had to call Mike and Pete up with a level of shame in my voice and ask them again how to lay out the room the right way. And I knew how, but I just 
panicked or choked or whatever, but you've got to get out there and you've got to put yourself out on the line. So you've got to get trained. We have to train people. We have to promise them a future, not promise them that we've got them locked up and we're not going to let them go anywhere. We should all constantly be training and educating our customers, our employees, ourselves to make us better and bring the industry up to technological standards. This was another interesting thing. I could probably do eight hours just on this. We all know what that is right there, that's VR. But now that VR right there that she's looking at, she's looking, this is the architect, and she is looking at all the finishes that are inside of that building right now through that VR that aren't really there yet. But now she can see them and she can move around the room and see the finishes. So if something doesn't look right, if the colors that she thought looked good, but now she can see it in a bigger, grander scale, um, it's not the right colors, now's the time you wanna make that adjustment. And by the way, that VR right there connects to some of these robots that I looked up and saw. So now I can go ahead, take the VR, run it around the room, show the robot where I want them to focus on or start at, and the robot can go ahead and do that. As always, you're going to need qualified installers and people that understand the right way because somebody's going to have to train the robots and somebody's going to have to come up with a way to do these things. But we are going to have to either either A, convince young the next young generation to come on in and join us on the complete manual labor side of things, or we're gonna have to start marrying ourselves to some of this modern technology that's out there. Nobody, by the way, is more shocked at what I found out than I am. I changed my opinion on this whole thing a ton as, I done, as I've done this research. And I challenge everyone out there, when you get a chance, when you go home at night, Google construction robots and just look at some of the stuff that's out there and what it's doing and how it's doing it. And where could we use that in our side of the business? By creating a, a simulated site scenarios, employees can be experienced hands-on and training before stepping foot on a site. Imagine you have a really big, important job. This is a huge job and it's big, it's huge for your company. Before any of your installers ever show up on there, they can go ahead and click on this VR and see the tile layout and see how it's going to look and see where it changes color or see where we're putting in that feature strip. And by having that visualization, then when they come out to the job, they're gonna be better prepared to put this in. And it's gonna give them a chance to think about Normally, I start here, but in this case, because of the layout, I'm going to move it over two feet. It gives them a chance to take their skill, their knowledge, their artistic ability, marry it with that technology, and now you got beyond a rock star. The training can be tailored for all construction activities through real-time visualization and technology. All right, you got a young kid on the job or you show up to go recruit. You go to a high school and you have a VR showing what you do for a living and showing how you take ugly floors and turn them into beautiful floors. And you they get to look at that in a real time through that VR right there. You might be able to convince some of them that this is a good idea. Installers will, on, will only be on site once their training has been successfully completed. You can go through a training program and it can be part of the install training program where you can teach them the next level on the install. They can try, they can try to lay out a room and then you can go back and tell them where they got it wrong and they can do it again and it can all be recorded. There's lots of tried and true, true old methods for training. We've tried them and done them all. We've been doing it this way for how many years? 20, 30, 40, 50 years? If we want to recruit the future, maybe we need to change our ways and we are and the way we are presenting our case. We're not doing a good job presenting our case to the next generation and we're letting it slip away to all these other trades and we're losing some really, really, really brilliant people that could be and that should be on our side. I tell everybody this and I'll say it to you out loud right now. Not one certificate of occupancy has been handed out until I show up on the job and put it in the floor. That goes for you too. 
until we show up and put the floor in, you can't get a certificate of occupancy on a commercial building. They're waiting for us. Let's not disappoint them when we get there. Let's make sure that we do a phenomenal knock up job that we do, that we use state of the art technology and that we are training the next generation as difficult as it might seem for us to reach out to them, that we are training the next generation of installers out there. We've kind of figured out millennials. There's been a bunch of stuff written about them, but however, the next generation that follows them is Gen Zers. They are born between 1995 and 2012. I have shoes older than that. I just, that number scares the heck out of me. But some of the things that they've been through, well, they've watched their parents go through an economic downturn, some cases lose their houses and stuff like that. So they are very concerned about debt and about how much money they owe. They don't believe they need to go to school as long as the generation before them did. They don't, they don't really see any value or benefit to it. They spend less time in school. They go and get their, they, they go get their bachelor's degree, but less and less of them are going to get master's degrees. And they're waiting until they figure out what do they wanna do for a, so what they've done is they've learned from their older brothers and sisters. They're extremely tech savvy. You have to remember at no point in time in their life from the day they were born, they had cell phones. Cell phones were there. They don't know what a beeper is. They don't remember a walkie talkie on a job or going to 7-Eleven with a roll of quarters and calling your boss from a, a phone at a 7-Eleven. None, none of that happened. None of that happened in front of them. Probably most of them have never seen a landline in a house. You want to entertain yourself, watch this generation try to use a dial-up phone. They are philanthropists. They're entrepreneurs. I'll give you a great example. My youngest son, Andrew, who is a drummer in a band, and I always worry that, you know, how is he going to make money? What's he going to do? He always figures out a way to make money. He buys drum sets. He refinishes them. He resells them. He buys baseball cards. He resells them. He buys guitars. He, he's, he's, a, he's an entrepreneur. He, he understands how to generate a, the money that he deems he needs. His goal isn't to make a pile of money and then worry about how to spend it. He has a completely different mentality than me. I don't think there is such a thing as enough money. He actually believes there is. He's very social. They are digital natives. This is a different group of people that you and I are trying to recruit. The final thing here, I'm proud of all the hard work I've done by hand. I, I Nobody can ever take that away from me. I have jobs that I that are in the back of my mind that I know I did it. I know people are enjoying it and they're living on it right now. And every now and then I'll go someplace and look down and a big smile will just shoot across my face because I put that floor in and it's still there and it's still functional and still doing what it's supposed to do. And that's never gonna change. But it's time to maybe start thinking about some of these extremely labor intensive stuff that we've done as part of our job and, take, and, and bring in some new technology to help lighten that burden up because we're not going to be we're not going to be able to convince the next generation that what we did as a living was a good idea. What they want is they want the end result that we got, but they see it a different way to get there. And I think we need to help them and maybe start to embrace that a little bit. I don't know the answers here. I'm, I have more questions now than when I entered into this presentation and started making it. But I just wanna let all of you know the work that we've all been doing out there, it looks phenomenal. And we, if anybody has any fantastic ideas on how they bring in the next generation, please share it with everybody. We're looking forward to it. We want to free up the construction artists so they can create the artwork that they do. On that note. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, that was excellent. Uh, I have five kids. I have three millennials, two X generations. So I, I, I 
I know all that stuff. Uh, my kids know technology so much more than I do. And they're the ones I call on to help me out. So <laughs> yes. I totally get that. Very yeah, I interesting. I think if we showed them some of these, you know, this robotics and some of these exoskeleton suits and stuff like that. By the way, I didn't, am I still on? Yes. That exoskeleton suit will allow you to pick up 250 pounds. That's amazing. All day long, you can just pick up 250 pounds all day long. I can remember humping wood from a for a basketball court, and the truck was parked like a quarter of a mile away, and it was across a dirt field, and you just basically had to throw two bundles of wood on your shoulder and walk across. I could have used an exoskeleton suit. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you could have. <laughs> My son has a 3D printer. He can do all sorts of things with that thing. Yep. Uh, virtual reality, the VR, love, right. you know. Right, He's got right. that. And I mean, it's again, great. I'll tell everybody to 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 lo start looking into it. Go down that rabbit hole I went into and just see all the potential. All of a sudden, my mind started going crazy with all the potential that is out there. Um, and I just don't know. I could be wrong. I could be missing them. But I don't think we're doing a good job embracing this technology and bringing it into our our work. Yes. So Google construction robots, you said, right? Yeah, start there and then take it from there. Well, we do have a, a few comments, questions here. Okay. Um, so I'll go ahead and dig right in. Jeff says, did you come across in cost comparisons on modular construction versus traditional construction? Um, I did, and the costs were a little bit cheaper on the modular, but I came across a really interesting fact, and it's only because I live here I know this. Uh, my brother-in-law has a house in, in the Florida Keys, actually in Kudjo Key, which was ground zero when the hurricane hit here. His house was on CNN, as a matter of fact. It was one of the houses that was split in half um, when the hurricane came through. And on his block, they had houses that were built and there was two modular homes. All the houses that were built on site were destroyed, and the two modular homes were the only homes that were not destroyed and were livable. And all the modular homes that were in the path of the hurricane were livable after the hurricane. Hmm. And so that got me thinking about modular homes a little bit differently, and then I started down this research and it's just like I I have to rethink a lot of things that I used to thought I that I thought I knew. Well, thank so, you yes, for that. There, there is a cost. There, there's a cost difference. It's it's cheaper because it, there's more control over it. There's not shutdowns. And again, if I built the same modular section of a house 150 times in a row, I probably would be pretty proficient at it. Right. I no would doubt. every move would be the right move. And that's mm -hmm. when the costs start being driven down. Well, we have uh, Jorge. He says, I think a hands on training is the best way to attract younger generations. We are at fault pushing them and approaching them with the old school whip and bashing. High yes. schools need to bring back wood shop. Yes. And that was his comment. Do you have any comments on that? No, I no, I agree 100 percent. I absolutely agree. I I can <laughs> when I went to high school we had wood shop, we had metal shop, we had home ec, right? And so traditionally prior this is on I'm right on the cutting edge. Prior to all the guys went to wood shop and metal shop and all the girls went to home ec. And I can remember my mom looking at me and going, if you're going to move out on your own one day, you better learn how to sew and cook and wash. And I took a home ec class. And then I started noticing there were girls coming into wood shop class and metal shop class. And then pretty soon there was no line. It just got delineated. There was no line there at all. Yeah, but we have to. We have to. You don't know if you're going to like something until you try it, right? So we just got to convince them to try it. The first time somebody builds something with their hands, there are some people you can look on their face and go, they're, they're disgusted with the fact that they got their hands dirty and they got a splinter. And there's other people, when they build something with their hands for the first time, their face is beaming. They built this. They did this. That was amazing. We got we to gotta root those people out and find them young and get them back attached. You're absolutely right. 
But, you know, I just want to thank everybody. And again, one more time, I want to let everybody know that that installs, that works in the install business, that works for somebody, knows somebody. I'm proud of everybody. I, the work we do is nothing short of amazing. And every time I go somewhere, every single time, I, I'm so surprised when I still see amazing floors going down and that are down. And I always try to envision who put this in. I was in a grocery store. I was on vacation. I'm in a grocery store. And it was something as simple as a VCT floor. And that's where I started my whole career. But whoever put that floor in knew what the heck they were doing. And I was looking at the floor and I'm like, I would like to meet this person. Like this person knows, this person gets it. They understand how to make the corrections on the fly and they get it. And it's nice to know that that tradition and that skill is still out there. And I'm just proud of everybody. Um, and we're gonna get through all of this. And when we come out the other side, hopefully, you know, we can get a automatic, if, they, if there's a Roomba, why isn't there a, an Edgeba? where it just edges the floor for us <laughs> automatically while we're drum sanding. So I never mind the drum sanding, but I hated edging. But thank you, Sam. Thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar sponsored by MAPEI. And if you have any other questions, please contact MAPEI with the information found on this last screen. And uh, on behalf of NWFA and MAPEI, thank you, Sam. Thank you for joining us today. Stay healthy and have a great wet rest of your day. Thank Thanks, you, Sam. you too.